evening, good evening, good evening. I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. I want to welcome you once again to Live at Five. It is Wednesday. It's five o'clock, so you know exactly what time it is. It is time for Live at Five. Listen, we're going to get to the midweek infusion. Uh, you've got some great questions that you asked. I've got some answers for you. Hopefully, you'll be blessed by it. I want to give you this midweek infusion, though. You know, part of what we want to do here at Live at Five is I like to give you something in the middle of the week to think about, something that I want you to contemplate, and something that is not just coming directly you know, from my mind, as creative as it may be, uh, this is coming directly from the mind of God. So I want you to begin to see what the Lord is actually saying to us at this particular time. I'm going to be reading out of Ezekiel chapter number 14. I'm going to start at verse number one, end in verse number four. Listen, before we begin, do not hesitate to share. I want you to share this. I think this is going to be so such a blessing. Share, tag, however you get it out. Make sure you get this to your friends and family because I think this is going to be a blessing. But listen, let's look at the word. Let's see what the word has to say. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat down in front of me. Then the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. These men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Therefore, speak to them and tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. When any of the Israelites set up idols in their hearts and put a wicked stumbling block before their faces and then go to a prophet. I, the Lord, will answer them myself in keeping with their great idolatry. I want you to begin to see that. Uh, you know, and it's really interesting. I think that the King James says that I'll answer them according to their idols, to the multitude of their idols. And it really is, I'm going to answer them concerning their idolatry. Now, I want you to look at this. These leaders were in exile, uh, you know, at this time, uh, and they were in exile in Babylon, and they were coming to the prophet Ezekiel to, to, to hear an oracle, to hear what the Lord has to say concerning Jerusalem, what was going on back home, and also things that, that was dealing with their exile. How long was it going to be before we were exiled? They were looking like they wanted to hear from the prophet, like they were dependent on God. So they were looking to hear this news. And as they're in this place of pretense, it's so much like, you know, people do today that, you know, that, you know, coming to church, got the big Bible under their arms. You know, they, they you know, they, they've got the, the, the Bible apps on their phone. You know, they worship the, the same God that looks like everybody else's worship. They don't bow down to any other gods that anybody else knows about. And they consider themselves believers on the same page. But notice here, God begins to identify a problem. And he identifies the real problem. He says to Ezekiel, listen, these men have set up idols in their heart. And that's really amazing because God has to give Ezekiel supernatural insight into their hearts because there's no way he could see it. You know, the Lord says, it's like in Isaiah where he says, these are like people who worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They love the rituals. They're part of the ceremony. But in truth, they haven't given me their heart. And the Lord is actually saying to Ezekiel, the prophet, to be aware. And he's revealing that no matter what is going on outwardly, you will not found, find the evidence of who they are from these outward things. But he says it's in their heart. Secretly, there's idolatry in their heart. Secretly, they're caught up in the culture and around them. Secretly, it, it hasn't worked. They have not been, you know, conform. they've been conformed to this world and have not been transformed by the renewing of their mind. Why? Because secretly, they are really with the culture. They're with what's going on. Th these people were with what was going on in Babylon. The, the, world, the word of God revealed that whatever the outward attitude, whatever the outward actions were that they're in their hearts, they were idolaters. And that as long as this idolatry in their hearts remained, that they were estranged from God. That's going to be so important for us to understand, especially as people are looking and saying, yeah, I'm ready to get back to church. Are you ready to get back to God? Because the question is, the Lord is revealing so many people are looking to get back to an activity and that many of us are looking at worship as an activity, not as a lifestyle, that our truth, our heart isn't with God, but our time 
is given to God on Sunday or even on a Wednesday where we attend Bible study or that choir practice. But the Lord is saying, no, no, I want you to look here. There is a charge against you because you've been infected by the environment. They have been infected by the Babylonian environment. They were secretly attracted to Babylonian worship. They were secretly attracted. And listen, there's so many people right now that are not willing to admit it, and I hope that you hear this, that have been attracted secretly to, to things that are contrary to God. And that though you're able to go and wash in the ceremonial pool of that great feeling of Sunday morning, washing in the ceremonial pool of your private closet of prayer, so you think. The reality is that God is saying they're not being washed at all because the truth of the matter is inside they actually like it. They were drawn to God, you know, when it, when it came time to the outward show, but their hearts were drawn to the world drawn to the culture around them, even idols around them, even false gods and false religions that have crept into the hearts of people that have watered down the gospel because they no longer believe everything. The Lord said, listen, should I be inquired by these people at all? Should I let them inquire of me? Should I be inquired of by them? The Lord is actually, actually saying, no way. When you look at this, he's telling Isaiah, don't worry about it. Don't, I'm not going to give you a word. There's no way I'm going to allow these people who are harboring these secret idolatries in their heart to actually play this religious game with me. And, and you know why? Because no true direction can be given to people who have already erected monuments in their hearts for other things. There are people who really love the idea of the fact that, like, I did my duty. I went to church. No different than I went to my job. But if I say, do you like your job? There are people who say, I've been there 20 years and I hate it. But here's why I'm doing it. Do you like that club? No. You know what? I've been a member for 20 years because of these reasons, but do you love it? No, I hate it. I'm not in it. My heart's not in it, but I've actually been a part of the March of Dimes because it's a good organization, but I don't like half the people. I don't even know what the mission statement is. So, so many of us are viewing the church and viewing the Lord the exact same way. I really don't even know him. I don't even totally understand him. I just do it because we've always done it. And the Lord is saying, do those people actually, when they pray, are they expecting me to answer? Like, are they really thinking that I'm obligated to answer them? Are they even able to hold me by the word that they don't even know because their hearts are completely estranged from me? Now that they are distressed, and that's really so amazing because so many people view God as the distress button. So now that they're distressed, and they only depend on me for an answer to get them out of that. Should I allow them to do that? And when you begin to do this, the Lord says, well, here's, here's what I want you to tell them. Tell them I, I'm going to answer. Them. It won't come from you, but I'm going to answer them, but it's going to be an answer of judgment. I'm going to answer them, but it's going to be an answer that they don't like. No oracle will be given by you. Don't worry about that. You're not a part of this. I'm going to answer them, but in actions and not in words. I'm going to, I'm going to answer them in judgment. Now, I want you to get this. This is not like God's going to get you because your heart's not right. Listen, I want you to understand what the Lord said. He says, I'm going to judge them and I'm going to do this that I may seize the house of Israel by the heart because they're far from me. Their hearts were far from God. And what God, the judgment that God was bringing was intended to grab them by the heart. Listen, there's some things that people are going through right now that, that, ha that are really an abandonment of who you are, an abandonment of your faith, an abandonment of the power that God has actually given you. You are living so far below. And I'm not talking about like because of the pandemic. I'm talking about because of your lack of diligence, your lack of study, your lack of faith in the Lord, your lack of trust. And all of those things combined together that allowed you to still stay in the game, still say I'm a believer, still attend church, go to Bible study, turn on this particular um, you know, broadcast right now, and yet still know that in your heart, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to change. In your heart, you know that, yeah, I feel the little prick of conviction, but you know, give me five minutes and it'll be over. The Lord says, listen, I'm bringing things in your life for one reason. I'm bringing some catastrophes in your life. There's some actual confrontations that are going on, but for one reason, not to kick you to the curb, but he says to grab them by the heart. In other words, God tells Ezekiel, I'm going to capture them. Listen, recapture them, as, as a matter of fact. When you understand the importance of that, that's really the message. There are hidden heart issues that are keeping so many people from God, and they're keeping them distant from God. But the Lord is coming with a remedy that 
even as he begins to, to tear down some things that have been idols in your life. Remove certain things that you depended on that, that were in the way of you depending on God. Know this, it's not because he's angry with you. It's not because he's in heaven pulling his hair out. It is simply because God says, I'm aiming at your heart. And I'm bringing these things. There's some people right now that are like that are in financial situations and you don't understand. Other people are going back to work. Other people kept their jobs. You know, what's going on with me? And God is saying, listen, I'm bringing you back to a place of trust. That's what it's about. I want your heart. Not that you can write down and jot down principles. Not that you can spew scripture out, but that you can live it and that you can actually trust God for real. So listen. I hope that that's a blessing for somebody out there. And I hope that there's some people that receive that, that the Lord is really looking for worshipers that worship him in spirit and in truth. You can't live a life of depression and be like everybody else and then shout like crazy because you are a king's kid on Sunday morning. Listen, away with all that uh, hypocrisy, away with all the games. Let's get serious about God and let's not give him just our brain. Let's not be the smartest people in the room, but let's make sure he has our heart so he can guide us in the direction that he wants to. And so that he can capture us once again and rapture us in that time. Listen, I hope that's a blessing for you. God bless you. And listen, let's get to our questions because we've got three good questions here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the first question to you. Um, it says, where do Christians get the image of Jesus since he is never described physically in the Bible? I think that's a great question. And I'm looking forward to answering that question. Uh, let's, let's do it. Listen, here, well, let me answer the question by starting out with a question. How do we know what aliens look like? Uh, or, or, or let me put it this way. How do we know that aliens actually look the way that they're presented in movies and in books and in literature, right? I mean, some of them have, you know, you can go all over the place, all, all over the world. You'll see the round heads, uh, you know, the cone heads with the big eyes and sometimes no mouth. Sometimes they're otherworldly and they've got, you know, teeth that protrude out and they're all teeth. Um, you know, the flying saucers are generally saucers. They're, they're circular. And so there are things that are like, when you begin to look at this, you have to ask yourself, how do we know that these are really what aliens look like when no one's actually ever seen an alien? And the answer to that is really, really simple. Hollywood actually created those images. That's exactly where they come from. And Hollywood has created the images, and most people have simply accepted the images of that, hey, that's what an alien looks like. So, you know, from the time that Hollywood has started that, up until now, you can take kids in California and a kid in Maine, and they'll draw a picture of an alien or a spacecraft, and it'll look so much the same. You know, generations, multitudes of generations have grown up drawing the same images, having nightmares about the same images, seeing aliens come down to Earth, and they look the same. Why? Because we've been taught to believe that those images are authentic. It's natural for people to create images when they have none. Listen, here's the truth. Nobody knows what Jesus actually looks like. Matter of fact, when you look at uh, our feeble attempt to try to figure this out, we, uh, you know, you can see this crazy transformation uh, in the first, you know, few hundred years uh, that you see through the artwork. Jesus looks totally different than he looks today. He looks nothing like he does today. In those old pictures, you know what you saw? In those old pictures, you would see Jesus and uh, you, you would see that he would gravitate between being Semitic or he would gravitate between being Mediterranean or even Northern African in some areas. And, you know, the images of Jesus in America and in, in Europe today are clearly white. Images of Jesus in Africa, right? And as you as you look in even some Caribbean areas, you'll see a black Jesus. You know, in many areas in Africa, there'll be a, a dark skinned Jesus, and and sometimes the coloration may be different based upon the coloration of the people that are there. Images in Jesus, images of Jesus in Asia are suspiciously Asian. He looks like he is from Asia, and so. Though there's, it's impossible for him to have looked like that, though it's impossible for him to have looked like many of the images that are there, this may be precisely the reason why his image is never mentioned and is not shown to be important in the Bible. Looking like Jesus is not about skin tone. Looking like Jesus is how we think. The Bible says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. 
And listen, I think you bring up a, a, a important question that is often overlooked in the church. And, and I want to deal with that. And it's the image that we have here in America of Jesus. This image of the scrawny white guy that you see hanging with his head down on the cross is not Christian. It's not, it's not a Christian image. Or, nor is it truly representative of anything that faith in Christ is actually all about. I can actually say it's not a Christian image because we know it's created. Right, we we know it's a created image, an image created by man. Man put that together. God never ever told us to do it. You know, He even warned us about worshiping images and making those images as idols, graven images, images that are created. Right. So we know that just because you know we point and say that's Christ, that does you know the cross, that doesn't make this Christian. You know, it, listen, it's an image created by a dominant culture to make God look like them. That's what every culture has actually done though. You know, this is not just, you know, European culture. This is every culture that gives him dreadlocks, that comes and gives him long, stringy, blonde hair. Any culture that gives him a, an Asian top knot, whatever it is, is just that dominant culture trying to make God look like them. Listen, understand something. The image that we're looking at is nothing special at all. Jesus, if, if th that guy that's on the cross there, that's not a special image. Many people suffered on the cross and died on the cross at the hands of the Romans. Many people did. But listen, nobody ever rose from the grave. No one, not only did no one ever rise from the grave, no one was ever resurrected back to life. But also no one had the power to give that power of resurrection to anyone else. That's what makes Jesus different. Not that cross. Not that being pierced in the side, that's happened to many people. So, you know, what we look, what we may look at is that maybe it may be better if we looked at an image of an open grave, an empty tomb might be better than, than the cross that we're looking at right now. That was never sanctioned by Christ, but was sanctioned by human artists. Hopefully that answers your question, because I think you're right on point. Let's look at uh, uh, question number two. I look at all these wealthy churches and I shake my head. How can Christians justify these incredible tax-free riches when Jesus commanded true believers to give away their money? All right. Slow this head shaking down for just a minute, right? I get it. Mm -mm -mm. These churches. Well, listen, I want to know. You know, I need, listen, I need to hang with you because I want to know where all these wealthy churches are. Let me give you a couple statistics just so we can see where we are in terms of these wealthy churches. The average church size, and listen, these, these, are, these are from scientific from scientific polls that have been taken. This is demographic information that's out there. You can just Google it if you want to. The average church size is 75, 75 members, and it's declining. And on top of that, the average church budget is $85,000 a year. Now, the, the, the average household income in 2020 was $97,973.61. The whole church budget on the average church has a complete budget that is less than the average household. That, that includes, if you want to look at the pastor's salary, any other salaries, insurance, the cost of the building, maintenance, that's everything. All of that, $85,000 was the average budget. Only 10% of all the churches in America, and there are about 400,000 of them, have members of 350 or more. 5% have members of 1,000 or more. And less than 1%, that's about 3,800 churches, out of 400,000, less than 1% are what we would call mega churches, which have more than 2,000 members that, are, that attend weekly. Most churches are not rich. Most churches are struggling. Most churches are just trying to pay their bills, trying to make sure that their mortgage is paid up, trying to take care of the buildings that are there. And I think it's in a bit of an assumption, you know, because I'm assuming you didn't do any kind of research here. You're just driving by a church and saying, wow, they have an addition onto the building. They must be doing well. Listen, if you look at the economy, the fact that, the, you know, restaurants up here, doesn't mean that they're making a lot of money. How many businesses that looked great, that had, you know, more square footage than the average church out there, looked like they were stable, but were going through, like any other business, going through economic hardship. 
listen, when you when your annual budget for the whole year is less than the annual income for a household, you this is not about being rich. So if you don't know what's going on inside, you, you're making an assumption and that the, all the money is being tied up in some kind of material possession. So I think that, you know, that has to be considered. And I hope that you're taking a look at that when, when you make that decision about these churches and about them being so wealthy. And the fact that you're tax-free, you know, tax-free, if you don't have a lot of money, you're not taxing anything. So when you look at this, you got to be careful here. But here's the second part. Did Jesus command the church or the believers in general to give away their money? You know, how can these churches be out here? you know, wealthy and, and, you know, living high on the hog when Jesus commanded them to give all their money away. Well, let's look at scripture again, because I can't find that. Jesus never commanded the church to take a vow of poverty. He never commanded the people of God to give all of their possessions away. Listen, Jesus himself had a money bag. Jesus had a treasurer. Judas was the treasurer. So when you begin to look at this, Judas was mad all the time. Listen, I don't know why you did that. That, that could have been given to the poor. That You know, Jesus had money, but he didn't give everything he had away. When Jesus spoke, and I know what you're looking at, the rich young ruler, and, and, and this is, in, I believe, in Mark 10, right? In verse 21, he says, go and sell what you possess and give it to the poor. That's not some universal command to the church. That's to him specifically. Let's read it. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. That's what the scripture says. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful because he had great wealth. Listen, Jesus was dealing with something specific with that man. This man was poor. Even though he had great wealth, he was poor because he depended on his wealth. Selling his possessions... And I want to put a capital H-I-S, his possession, it freed him. Why? Because money was in his way. It wasn't in, it's not in everybody's way. It was in his way. How do we know? Because Jesus talks about this perfect man. And he says, listen, you'll be perfect. He didn't say everybody will be perfect. He says, listen, let me tell you what a perfect man is. A perfect man, as it relates to his relationship with God, a perfect man is a man who has nothing between him and God everybody's issue isn't money. No way. God would never have told us that he would give it and promise prosperity. It, you know, there's no reason to give it to you if he doesn't want you to have it. So the reality is, that's not true. The, re the, the, the reality that's here is that God is going to remove anything and he's going to offer us the opportunity to give up anything that is between him and us. And he says this perfect man has nothing between them and God. So let's make sure as we look at this, we can't apply this to everyone. Paul said, listen, I'd rather you all be like me. That, that none of you would marry. Well, that's, that, that is not, and you can't take that scripture and then come and say, so Paul said no one should get married. No, read the whole thing. He says later, it's better to marry than to burn in lust. So you, you got to read this whole thing. And reading the whole thing will help you understand why Jesus went this radical way with him because he needed a radical change. We all need a radical change, but it's not always around money. So listen, let's be careful as we look at the church and recognize that the church is also in the world. Though not of the world, still in the world. And you know what? There may be great work that's being done in that family life center that you may be looking down on. There's a lot of great evangelism that can happen at, on that basketball court that you're wondering why they even have. And that swimming pool is not just used for swimming. There's all kinds of rehab that can happen in that pool. And there's baptisms that can happen in that pool as well. So as we're looking at the church resources, I'd like to turn people and look and say, well, listen, why aren't you wondering why they have all these things? And why is it so bad for the church to have some things? Shouldn't Christian children be able to have wonderful playgrounds to play on at their church. What, is it crazy that someone would have something nice when it con is connected to the church? Because you know what? God's people are there and God wants us to have nice things. He simply doesn't want those things to become idols to us, nor does he ever want us to depend on those things for our well-being. So hopefully that's an understanding there that will help. That you'll get an understanding of exactly what we're talking about here and why that's so important. Listen, let's get to question number three. This is our final question. 
It says, when all believers are raptured from the earth, doesn't that mean that there will be no believers at the start of the tribulation? Great observation. You know, these are, I love the questions today because they, some of them are, are questions that are confirming questions, as it was with the one concerning the image that's there. You know, confirm some things that people are looking and saying, hey, I'm thinking about this. I need to know if I'm on the right track. Just like you're on the right track with the image, where Christians have gotten this, and I, I know historically where we've gotten it, but we've gotten off track with it as well. You know, it's a shame if you get Christians, you know, I, I can't leave without my lucky cross. Man, that, that's that's way out there. Well, this is also a great question that is connected to something that just needs to be confirmed. Sounds like you believe this already. And I think it's, a, again, a great observation. And many people really never look at this truth of what's going to happen, you know, during this time of the rapture. And will there be any believers? Will the world be empty of all believers? And the answer to that is yes. At the rapture, all Christians are removed from the earth. Right, the 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 dead shall rise for the dead in Christ shall rise first. So there's not even any Christian dead here that will be left on the earth. Let alone those that are alive that will be caught up in the air with the Lord. So that's wonderful news for the believer that will be alive at the time, or even had died before that. That you know, at the time of the rapture, every believer is going to be raptured up. Every element of the church age will end and will be raptured up with the Lord. So when that happens, the believer, A, is going to be saved from the tribulation. They'll escape all the things that are, you know, that are going to be a part of what the evil one, the Antichrist, is going to do in this world and the time of tribulation. Those three and a half years of peace, though there really won't be peace, and then another three and a half years of turmoil and tribulation and chaos, the believer will not have any, any part of that. It's a bad news, though for non-Christians. It's a bad news. It's really horrible news for those who did not believe, those who refused to believe at the time of the rapture. You know, th those who just refused to hear the word of God, they're going to enter into tribulation and they're going to enter into suffering. Now, the one of the great sufferings that will be there will be the thing that you ask. There will be no Christians here to explain even the rapture, what happened. You know, we didn't believe it before. There'll be no Christians here to believe, to explain how that happened. There'll be no Christians here to lead anybody to Christ. There'll be no one here to say, well, here's what you must do to get saved. You know, th now what has been left in the earth, uh, sermons that have been left in the earth, memory will still be there. They'll have to remember those sermons. They'll have to remember. They'll find the information in the literature. As man has always found what is illicit information, Christian knowledge will be illicit. And so, but he'll find it. The, it'll, it'll be there because it's not gone from the earth. The word of God is still going to be here. And here's the wonderful thing about it. The good news is that the Holy Spirit is still working at this time in the earth. A, he's omnipotent. So he's going to, he's everywhere. But the, the salvation is going to be offered during this time. It's just going to be received at great peril and at great cost. It's going to cost. The, the, not taking the mark of the beast is going to cost you your life. Proclaiming Christ during the tribulation period will cost you your life, but men will still be indwelled by the Holy Spirit because that indwelling of the Holy Spirit by any who ask has been promised by God and has never been rescinded. And just because there's a tribulation does not mean that it will be rescinded. Remember the scripture that tells us that there will be a multitude that cannot be numbered that are going to be saved during this time. If the, if the Spirit of God were not available, if the Spirit of God was not here during the tribulation period, no one could get saved, but he will be here because we know that there will be this number that will be, sa that will be saved, this number that, that no man can number. But so what's the answer? You're right. Christians are going to be gone. So that means we've got to get urgent now. Because the best solution, the only solution right now for the believer, for the person who is unsaved, who does not want to experience the tribulation, who doesn't want to come to Christ under those circumstances, who does not in any way want to meet the Lord through that kind of pain. Because that can happen tonight. It can happen tomorrow. It can happen in an in, in instant. Listen, it's to believe in Christ now. It is really for us to get out there and to really begin to speak about this great offer, to talk about this death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that people can believe in him now. Because Jesus has promised through his word that anybody who believes in him would not perish, 
but would have everlasting life. That's what, why we've got to get urgent because the rapture isn't just, man, I'm saved. It is really looking at those that are left behind and the trauma they're going to have because they won't have the church is going to be major. So listen, kids, like, like get saved now. That's the message. Get saved now. Listen, this is the end of our Live at Five. I'm so glad that you were here again. I hope that this was a blessing for you. And I want you to share this. And my hope is that you were educated and moved by what you heard and that you would not only just hear this word, but you'll also get ready to do it. Listen, let's examine our hearts. And if you have any questions that you want to have, I'll be glad to read those at Live at Five on our on Wednesdays. Don't hesitate to reach out to me at ApostleWalker at, at gmail.com or you can always reach me at Facebook. You can check me out on Messenger. Send me a message. However you choose to get to me at our at our website, disciplesoffaith.life. I've got multiple ways that you can, that I can be reached. I want to answer your questions. God bless you and have an awesome Wednesday.